in uh, Karim uh, Nader's uh, lecture. I think you don't need the presentation because you have already known him. You know that he's also practicing uh, Chinese <laughs> these days. And um, okay, now it's a great pleasure to have him here, like Pedro Valerio, as a teacher and professor of our workshop. But it's also a way to, for us, for the school, for uh, all of us, to know something better about uh, some uh, very interesting and important experience in international architecture. So we have met, uh, met okay, we have known by distance uh, Karim uh, two years ago during, uh, well, last year. Yeah, yeah, yeah one, one year and a half. No. Last year, exactly. <laughs> last year, yeah. uh, for, uh, well, for some uh, case. Uh, I have known because uh, we have read uh, this uh, book that is. Uh, the, oh, <laughs> It is a very nice, and I suggest you to look easier if you want to see. It is a book he published with an Italian publisher, Lettera 22. And what is, I guess, fantastic of this experience is that, and I want also to refer what Pedro showed, you, showed us yesterday night, is the ability to build a parallel path. So we have the architectural and design path, and I think we we will see some uh, also images, some photos of projects uh, now, but also the ability to, to tell, to communicate, to, to tell a story, to tell the story of architecture, to tell the story of design. So the book is divided in a normal book and a sort of script that you can see in a small part here, where he, he, I mean, he tested, maybe he experimented, a point of view about uh, life, about architecture, about society, about landscapes. And, and this is what uh, is, makes the difference from a normal design, we can say, and a design strongly within a personal experience. So I give you the floor, thank you very much, and uh, still sorry for the delay also for persons uh, who are uh, attending the conference well, through web Thank you. Thank you, Miguel. So, uh, thank you for having me. <laughs> it's a pleasure. Um, so, I wanted to, um, to continue a bit on the conversation we, we started with, uh, with Pedro, which is uh, those uh, a bit difficult situations uh, which are uh, producing uh, architecture. Uh, I come from Lebanon, which is a place of conflict, uh, I think. Uh, you have seen uh, some images of uh, all the catastrophes that uh, we have been through. And um, of course, uh, when I talk about uh, a bit dramatic things, it doesn't mean that I'm a dramatic person. On the contrary, I'm uh, in general very hopeful and happy. And um, that's also what we were uh, discussing, uh, which is that despite the somehow um, preoccupying situation of architecture uh, currently in the world, uh, I think there is a space for creating beautiful things. Uh, there is um, a mystic who was born somewhere before, between 400 and 600 uh, before Christ. Every source gives a different uh, date. Uh, he is Chinese. Uh, and uh, he has written in old Chinese uh, a book which is called Tao Te Ching, uh, which is, uh, and his name is Lao Tzu. Uh, and uh, it's not because, you know, uh, I'm learning Chinese in my studio that I mention him. Uh, it's, I mention him because uh, he has been uh, a life force uh, behind me since more than 20 years. Uh, he has inspired me, and um, I would like to show how uh, his philosophy, his spiritual philosophy, has um, allowed me actually to uh, go past uh, the obstacle.
So uh, I have entitled uh, this lecture uh, "Lessons in Darkness." Oh, so uh, to we are working with the darkness currently. <laughs> Thank you, Michele, for contribution contribution to, to darkness, uh, to darkening the room. Uh, basically, the the idea is that. Um, we are faced uh, in our practice and in our life, I mean, it's a human condition, but of course in architecture maybe a bit more accentuated, uh, we are faced with uh, situations which are unpleasant. And all the more in uh, places of conflict, uh, such as Lebanon and Beirut in particular. And uh, the uh, idea is to see whether Darkness is something which is negative, or darkness is something which is, which is, in fact. And the isness of it could be the beginning of a certain design. You have all seen uh, those images. These are uh, past the war. I mean, the war started in 1975 and officially ended in 1990. Uh, but the consequences of the war the last 30 years have been even more catastrophic than the end of the war. And of course, there was uh, all the work uh, of reconstruction, uh, but also um, a country that needs to be put back in place. Uh, like, I, I hear all the time the Europeans complain uh, about uh, the mediocrity of uh, the decision makers and the politics and so on and so forth, which I completely understand because uh, there needs to be an improvement, uh, in particular in terms of uh, high-level political decision-making in relationship, in particular, to the environment. And it's not only European, uh, it's also, of course, American and Chinese, who are the two biggest polluters currently. Um, but when you don't have electricity, you don't have this type of discourse because you, you would like to have the basics first, you know, to have electricity. Last year, for example, we were doing a lot um, online and I was struggling with what source of electricity and what source of internet to use so that I stay online uh, during the presentations. Uh, so in uh, October uh, 2019, there has been uh, the beginning of a revolution. People were on the street. Uh, and it was coupled with a financial crisis. Uh, the building that you see in the background is the uh, central bank, uh, which was uh, designed by a couple of uh, Swiss architects that are called Adore et Julia. They, they built several um, very interesting modernist buildings in Beirut. And in the foreground, you can see, I mean, I commissioned this photo <laughs> uh, to a photographer uh, to uh, you see that there has been a barricade of uh, concrete that was put in front of uh, the central bank uh, because they didn't want the revolutionaries to enter into the central bank. Of course, this is also a representative of uh, the dramatic uh, financial situation that we are going through. Uh, currently, for example, uh, putting your money in the bank is an unsafe idea, as well as all the money that you had in the bank, uh, you don't have access to it. So it's like suddenly, you know, you uh, find yourself that you have zero money. And uh, you uh, have to either uh, work in cash, so you go ask your client, please, can you give me banknotes instead of uh, making a bank transfer? Uh, and uh, currently, for example, I have a credit card, which is actually in a Lebanese bank, but we are always preoccupied whether the bank, you know, collapses. Therefore, you find yourself with nothing. Uh, Opposite to, uh, to the building of uh, the Banque du Liban, there is uh, a building which is called uh, the Enter Design Building. It was built by a Lebanese architect, his name is Khalid Khouli, and he was one of the pioneers of modernism uh, in uh, Lebanon, and of course of uh, the ones who experimented with, uh, with concrete. The building is from the 70s. Um, and what uh, fascinated me about these two buildings is uh, on one hand, the, the, the ideological and, pres and presence of the grid of the Banque du Liban versus the more sculptural approach 
uh, of Khalil Khouli for his uh, showroom building because he used to sell uh, furniture. And uh, I had the opportunity uh, to build a building uh, that would be uh, between the two and that would actually belong uh, to the central bank. Uh, there was actually an existing structure and uh, we had to uh, intervene uh, on the structure to make it um, uh, seismic, to, to protect it from, from the seismic issues uh, and to uh, as well make it, uh, make it protected and give a new face to, to the bank. Uh, so uh, the idea was very simple, in fact, uh, to take all the genealogies uh, of uh, those histories, on the one hand, this uh, gridded modernism, and on the other, the slight sculptural approach of uh, Khalil Khouri, and to uh, express it in a steel skeleton, an exoskeleton that we would put on top of the existing building that would anyway fix the problem of the seismic issue is because the building was not anti-seismic. So basically we needed anyways to put a steel exoskeleton on the building, but we decided to do it as a sculptural grid. Uh, also, uh, I wanted to say that in as much as the central bank is a very hated <laughs> uh, uh, institution uh, at this point because of the, the whole corruption level that is attaining uh, very high, high levels. Um, I wanted still to say that an institution uh, such as the, the central bank should um, portray ideas of transparency and naturalness. Therefore, uh, the insistence on a certain, on the, on, the, on the maximum transparency possible, maximum glass possible, and uh, maximum vegetation uh, possible. So in this photograph, uh, you can see uh, the different items that I've been talking about. So for example, here, can you see my mouse? Yes. Uh, so this is the building of, the, of Adore Julia, the central bank building from the 70s. This is uh, Ali Khouri and the design outside of the bank campus. This is the edge of the campus here. And this building belongs to the central bank. It's the capital market uh, authorities. It is also to tell you, of course, that we live in a chaos. Uh, and that uh, in the absence of uh, clear urban planning regulations, clear urban design regulations, what remains is uh, to follow the rules as much as you can, although there's a lot of bending of the rules happening all the time, uh, but also to uh, create your own rules and uh, have uh, your own agenda. Uh, as it turns out, the building was uh, quite loved, uh, by, the, by the people in the area, I asked around. It's also at the end of, uh, of a street, so it had quite a prominent uh, perspective. And people also understood uh, the simple message of, uh, of this building, how it relates to, uh, to the institution, uh, how it uh, still contradicts the opacity uh, of the institution by a certain you know, metaphor of the transparency. And it's the only uh, building that has a vegetation on, um, on Banque du Liban campus. Uh, Beirut is a city of layers, um, of course. Uh, it's a city of uh, millennia of uh, civilization. All of Lebanon is uh, thousands of years old. Uh, we have a city which is called Biblos, uh, which is 4,000 years of continuous inhabitation. We have also been invaded by the Romans, maybe you know. And uh, the Romans, as I said in one of the conversations, there is a cardo under the Comanus inside Beirut. Uh, we have also a lot of uh, Roman temples along all of uh, Lebanon um, for Jupiter, Bacchus, Venus, and other uh, deities. Uh, it's, a, it's a country that has been um, invaded practically all the time uh, because, because it's, a, it's a crossroads of Europe, Africa, the Arab world, uh, and uh, Turkey from up, so basically uh, the beginning of Europe. It's at the eastern side of uh, the Mediterranean, so it's a very desirable geographical location. Therefore, all the problems. This is from inside the campus. So you see uh, the dialogue of uh, the building with the uh, original uh, headquarters building. 
some new buildings that were done later on uh, by the by the bank and the back side of uh, the building uh, we have proposed it's not as dark but i mean a bit the uh, projection is a bit dark uh, i'm interested also to show you this image uh, which is an image of uh, the street experience uh, whereby uh, the building sits within uh, somehow also a continuation of uh, the existing uh, vegetation. Uh, the um, governor of the central bank also requested that he would have uh, a duplex <laughs> on top of the building. So the, the last two floors are uh, for the governor to, uh, to rest, uh, while the rest are uh, for the, um, the capital market authorities. I do not have any photographs of the interior. It was already uh, a, a challenge to photograph the exterior with a lot of uh, uh, permissions to get, um, and uh, as I said, you know the, uh, the I mean the whole the whole fact that the project happened uh, was already uh, a challenge. I like also this uh, photograph where we see Beirut in layers. Uh, it is quite common in Lebanon and in Beirut as well uh, to to see a building that is unfinished uh, because of this situation of uncertainty in, in which we live. Uh, therefore, uh, projects start, uh, banks collapse, and projects end. This is very typical of the modernist period, just before the 1975 uh, civil war. Uh, this is very typical of, of the 1990s, this sort of uh, ugly uh, revivalism. Uh, this is uh, earlier. This is uh, the Ador et Julia headquarters and the building. These are some photos from uh, what we call the, the golden age, uh, large door, where uh, this street, it's called uh, Alambi, uh, after the, the name of a French uh, general. We were also a French mandate uh, from uh, the end of the First World War, 1918, until 1943, the declaration of the independence uh, of Lebanon. Uh, in the uh, in the 60s, just before the, unfortunately, the civil war, uh, we were called the Swiss, Switzerland, we were called the Switzerland of the East. Um, because basically it was the opposite of the current situations. The banks in, in Lebanon were considered the safest place to, to put your money. And basically there was a huge affluence uh, of uh, wealth as well as uh, tourism. Uh, in Beirut. Those pictures are from this period. It's also to show you that urbanistically and architecturally, it was very much uh, influenced by the French mandate, but also the Turkish uh, uh, period. I mean, we were invaded by the Ottomans, by the Turks for 400 years before the French. And also certain ideas that you would find in Venice, like this uh, Tripora, uh, which uh, were the result of a lot of communication in the Mediterranean between uh, Venice and, uh, and Lebanon, which became also very typical of the, um, of the, typical of the Lebanese houses. Uh, I want also to talk about the rhythm, the, the organization of the street, also the, the layering on the ground floor, the body, and then the, the typical uh, pergolas on the higher levels, because I would like to talk about a project which uh, I proposed uh, in this, on the this street in 2007. These are uh, photographs of uh, after the war, so from the, from the 90s, where basically uh, very famous photographers came to Lebanon to, to look back at LMB Street uh, post uh, the uh, post-war. So, uh, I was uh, invited, you know, it was the beginning of my career. I was still uh, really a beginner. And uh, it was uh, the first attempt at this project was 2004. And then the second attempt was 2007. And then there was some revisions in 2009. Uh, basically, um, I was approached by a cinema operator. And uh, he wanted to um, implement a high-tech uh, high-end new new technology uh, cinema in the middle of Alambi Street that uh, you just saw, and that would be connected to the souks. The souks are those uh, markets uh, traditionally uh, that were completely 
uh, demolished uh, by the war, and they were rebuilt by a Spanish architect, um, Rafael Moneo. Uh, and there was this very unusual site, which was on an alley, which is slightly going upwards, and then the souks were behind it. And it was an opportunity for me, architecturally, to connect the street with the souks. I wanted people to be able to go through the building uh, and to enter into the cinematic, the cinematic world. I also wanted to divide the building in uh, three lines. The line of the gallery, very typical of Beirut, with the little lanterns. This is a photograph of the model. Uh, the line of the body, which is usually several floors, but which uh, I propose as one lobby space. And the line of the pergola, which is typically the place where uh, you are uh, looking back at uh, the city, which I propose as an entertainment park experience on several levels that you could access also by its own uh, set of elevators. Uh, the idea was to make a statement about uh, the uh, colonial um, rhythms uh, of uh, typical Beirut and to render them immaterial and somehow dreamlike by the introduction of uh, the cinematic imaginary uh, through the syst a system of uh, very big scale projections in which the lobby becomes uh, the, the space for the creation of image making of the person themselves before they enter into the actual IMAX or the other screens. Of course, the building would not be that transparent. We, we did also the structure in transparent plexiglass. Of course, it would not be the case, but it is also to express uh, through the model the concept yes. itself. Um, I wanted the image of the cinema to project itself back onto the city. As you are driving towards uh, the building, you would be entering into this uh, dematerialized version of uh, the rigid ideologies of, uh, of Beirut. Also in the model, we put uh, Juliette Binoche from uh, Trois Couleurs Bleu, uh, who is a woman in search for freedom uh, in the film, because uh, the three films are Liberté, Liberté, Egalité, Fraternité, so the blue is freedom. Uh, so, uh, I mean, there's a small uh, statement there as well. This is the back side, so this is underground. This is the level of the souks. And this is the, uh, the back facade where the garden of the souk uh, I intended would start to grow onto the facade. There would be another lobby for the VIP access uh, and another ground floor which would be elevated that you would access through staircases and uh, uh, escalators from Anandi Street all the way to the souks and other underground uh, screens as well. Everything was done in a way that we would uh, have uh, the, the, the best image possible, the best sound possible, the best experience uh, of cinema possible. Uh, my oper the operator who commissioned this project to me had very good knowledge of how to do very good cinema, and we applied all those principles. So these are uh, snapshots of uh, how we imagined uh, different moments, uh, whether from outside the building as you are getting to the building, uh, or as you are passing through, or you are experiencing the lobby, or from the lobby back down to the street, or passing through uh, the gallery, or arriving to the souks uh, level through the escalator staircase experience. These are from the other side, uh, all the experience of the park uh, extending itself onto the building and uh, towards the building. So uh, this project was the, be the beginning of really experiencing what architectural heartbreak means. Uh, so uh, what happened is that the operator didn't follow up properly with the um, with the company, I mean, basically Beirut, the center of Beirut was taken over by a private company after the, after the war. 
and this private company is called Solidaire, they were running all the projects of the central district. They brought the French architect to do the Cineplex before me, and they did a very lousy job at it because they didn't know how to do a contemporary proper cinema. So the operator came and told them, no, I'm going to explain to you how to do uh, a great state-of-the-art cinema. So he did this design and presented it to them. And then it's his fault partially as well. He didn't follow up properly. And then what they did is simply they took all the ideas that were in this project, went back to the French architect, did another project with all the principles that we talked about, and they built it. <laughs> Lessons from darkness. So uh, this is, you know, when you live in a place where there's no legislation. It's the jungle. Basically, anything could happen. And you know, I had to put my heart and soul into this project, of course. You know, it was the opportunity of a lifetime, you know, to come and place in the middle of Beirut everything that Beirut needed, you know, a clear, transparent statement of where we need to go, and contemporary as well, not a pastiche. Um, so, I mean, I still, you know, have a bit of a heartache, you know, when I think about this project. And I still think that of all my attempts as, as concepts, it might be the best thing I've ever attempted. But it doesn't matter. The, uh, this image is uh, from uh, a street in, uh, in Beirut, which is called uh, Bouro. Bouro also is a uh, French uh, general. Uh, and uh, Again, you know, the layering, the complexity of Beirut is always at work. Uh, and this, this is a project, actually. Uh, I was approached by um, a man who wanted to... Um, who wanted... Urbanista. Urbanista. Uh, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a cafe. It's called uh, Urbanista. Uh, uh. So, so basically, this man told me, can we have... Uh, an office, can you have a communication agency office on the ground floor of uh, Busy Guru? Busy Guru is basically, you know, pubs, restaurants, uh, it's, it's a busy, busy, you know, very lively street in Beirut. <coughs> uh, yeah, it's a wonderful idea. And uh, I would like to take back some of the ideas of the cinematic and place them uh, at your. Um, at the facade and in the space of your shop. I mean, it's not a shop, it's an, it's an office. It's a communication agency office. Uh, so, so basically, uh, a communication agency office is about the creation of images, and I wanted uh, all uh, the, the possibilities of moving images uh, to, to happen uh, on this facade. It's called 1984, his company, uh, like the book uh, by uh, George Orwell. And, uh, of course, it was very interesting to me because 1984 talks about um, this uh, society of uh, observation and uh, a certain uh, ideology which is taking over the minds of uh, the population. So uh, we developed an idea of... It's a very small space. So we developed an idea of uh, a simple central table where they would be working. And in front of the central table, there would be... Uh, after 1.4 meters, a very light translucent curtain, uh, which would create an in-between space that can create a bit of kind of transparency because the curtain is just trans translucent. And it could be also the place to do some projections on the curtain at night. There would be more offices and then a polycarbonate uh, partition. And then on top, he would have a small private office with the dentist chair because his father was a dentist and he was asking me, you know, can we have the dentist chair as part of the communication agency? Told him why not. So he would have the dentist chair. He would have a neon saying the power of ideas that you can see all the way from the street because of the transparency situation of the, of the project. The idea is that it would be a bit like Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Like by day, it's, you know, the specified office. It's whitish and uh, somehow clean. And at night, it would become uh, a sort of event space where he would uh, receive, he could, uh, uh, he could have uh, a DJ on the top part of the polycarbonate uh, 
playing the music and we can have somehow erotic films being projected on the curtain. So we built it. Um, I actually, by the way, uh, everything that I'm showing you in this presentation is photography. And when it's a drawing, you will notice that you will know that it's a drawing. There is no random. Uh, it's also an attitude that I have done in, uh, on my Instagram. There is no rendering. In the book, there is no rendering. Uh, so um, he had a table. We thought maybe we will paint a bit the, the legs in, uh, uh, in gold, in uh, gold leaf. The, the neon, the polycarbonate trans uh, um, partition. And as you enter towards the bathrooms, we use the images from the publicity of the 1984 Apple computer which talks about 1984, this society of, um, of domination, of uh, uh, control, this controlling society, and this woman which actually runs through uh, this uh, whole population which is asleep uh, and uh, has the, uh, the power of ideas. It was the beginning of the Apple computer. I have to go faster. So you start to see, you know, the blur of uh, Beirut in the background. After all, I wanted also to give them a certain uh, uh, coziness to be able to work inside the, the space. Most of the walls and the floors and the ceilings were kept as is, uh, also for uh, lack of budget. There was no point, you know, in, uh, in overdoing it. Uh, and just expressing things as they are. These are walls that are maybe 150 years old. Uh, which are part of the beginning of the 20th century. This is part of Beirut. I mean, when I say Beirut in layers, it's really literal. Beirut is made out of layers. And the layers uh, can be read in the project that is uh, proposed. This is a reverse shot uh, where you are, you know, passing by uh, in the street at night. Imagine, you know, that you have all these clubbers passing. Uh, the people in the pubs, people in the restaurant, and there would be this strange disruption of imagery that would be happening at one moment. It could be also, you know, that they are projecting, I don't know, uh, a football match. We also put the 1984 Apple computer because he had it, in fact. So it was exhibited as if uh, in a museum, and then there's the layer of the curtain, and then uh, this, uh, this space inside. Another sad story is that, unfortunately, the, the project was demolished by the explosion. <laughs> so uh, the, in, uh, in 2020, in August 2020, there was a huge explosion at the port of Beirut. Uh, and uh, basically, the project was evaporated. Uh, and he, he never had the heart to, to come back to the same location. And so well, what remains uh, of the project is uh, the photography. Of course, it's all uh, set up. <laughs> so this is a cool uh, small animation of um, the whole project. So uh, in 2016, I decided to open my fully uh, independent office uh, after uh, collaborating uh, with a couple of friends uh, earlier on from 20, 2008 to 2016. I called it the Karim Nader Studio. 
Uh, I thought studio because studio uh, means a study. So it's something which is uh, ongoing, it's a research. And also uh, une étude in French is a form of uh, music, which I like as well. I would like to talk about my bread and butter. Uh, my bread and butter is uh, people who come to me and want to do uh, the house that they are dreaming of. You know, they've been dreaming for a certain amount of time to have a house. And they come to me. And I've become known actually for this. You know, people come to me for doing their dream house. Uh, one of the latest ones is uh, in Ivory Coast, in Abidjan. And this is a photograph of Abidjan. There's this uh, hotel, which is called the Hotel Ivoire. And Abidjan is a very contradictory city, maybe more contradictory than Beirut, because it's very widespread. And it's very uh, green. It's like a tropical jungle that is spreading with a lot of uh, lagunas. So you have the water of the sea, which is entering the ocean, which is entering into the, uh, the, the city. And then you have some modernist blocks here and there, uh, which is also part of, uh, you know, uh, Ivory Coast is Côte d'Ivoire, which it was a French colony, not a mandate even. Uh, so from the colonial past, there was those uh, modernist interventions. And today, really, uh, Abidjan sits in this contradictory um, language of this naturalness of those palm trees and coconut trees and lavish greenery because it's raining all year long and it's warm all year long. And then those modernist blocks. And my client had a site uh, where uh, in the middle of the city, he has a jungle. So this site is across the street from the hotel. And this is where he wants to build, build his house. In the middle of the city, in a jungle. Talk about contradiction. And he had amazing trees, such as uh, different types of palms and neem and coconut and so on, which are growing there uh, naturally. This is him, actually, uh, with his car. And uh, basically, I went there, you know, and he told me, can you build a house <laughs> for us? Uh, and he had, you know, done a competition with three architects, and then one of the architects won, and then he was still not happy with the house, and then he worked with two other architects, still not happy, and then I found you, uh, you Lebanese, he's Lebanese as well, because there's a lot of uh, Lebanese uh, diaspora in, um, in Ivory Coast. Uh, can you do the house? I mean, yes, I can try, of course. Uh, so <laughs> So uh, I called it La Maison Ivoire because, I mean, the hotel across the street is called Hotel Ivoire. Ivoire means ivory, um, simply like that. And uh, very early on, I told them, you know, your project is going to be fragmented. I'm going to explode the house into three parts. Uh, they're going to be like those modernist blocks, pure and white. And we're going to sit in the middle of your urban jungle and enjoy being in the urban jungle, preserving as many trees as we can. And we are going to create an improvement uh, canopy, a circle, that's going to interconnect the three volumes. This is one, this is two, this is three. And there will be a circle that is going to be interconnecting all of this, which is the traditional uh, house of the African, uh, of the Ivory Coast jungle. It's a circle that where it rains in the middle. Uh, so I told them, you're going to have a house where it will rain in the middle of it. They were like, okay, <laughs> uh, can we see more? <laughs> so uh, we worked on it and uh, we developed uh, certain drawings. Uh, so there's the circle, doesn't show so well in the projection. And then you have the three volumes, the, the main house, the tower and the cube. The tower is uh, looking back towards the Laguna and towards the Hotel Ivoire, which has this tower. Uh, then there is the canopy circle. So the canopy circle is very simple. It's uh, uh, tech wood from Ivory Coast. They have uh, you know, their own uh, forests of uh, renewable tech, actually. So it's a simple pergola, which is covered partially with uh, fabric as needed. And then the, the rest of it uh, is open. 
And in the middle, there would be the space to uh, enjoy, to stay, to be, uh, and to uh, enjoy also the rain as you are in the pool. So you are in the swimming pool and it's raining on you. For, don't forget your, that you are around 20 degrees all year long, so it's perfect weather all the time. Um, of also to be noted that this is a place that doesn't have a view. Uh, so it is, was not important for them to organize the house towards a view. On the contrary, they wanted to organize the house towards uh, the center. So this is a model of, uh, of the project, uh, whereby uh, there is those volumes, the main house, which has the three bedrooms for the parents and the kids, the tower, which has a family room, a guest room, and a sort of belvedere looking back uh, above the, the tree line, the cube for entertainment, the pergola all around, the pool, and the garden. It is currently uh, under construction. Uh, so uh, it's actually this photo is maybe a month old. It, we have progressed uh, even more. Uh, so this is the situation uh, to uh, basically try to place uh, those volumes in the middle of this, uh, this urban jungle. Uh, it will be clad with uh, very white uh, stone, uh, which is an engineered stone. Uh, which will make those volumes white and reflective, and then uh, it will be contrasted by the local circle, but also the local wood. Another one of my uh, bread and butter, this is switch situation in the south of Lebanon. Uh, basically, currently we have, because of the financial crisis, this is, you know, one of the un unexpected <coughs> unfoldings of terrible things that people cannot put their money in the bank. And a lot of people, a lot of Lebanese people live in Africa. In Africa also there's a, there's a bank crisis. So usually what they used to do is that they take their money in Africa and send it, put it in the bank in Beirut. But there's no more bank in Beirut. So, oh, I had this project of doing a house in the south of Lebanon. Contact the architect. So 2019, which is the beginning of the revolution and the financial crisis, means for the architect who's doing dream houses, actually the beginning of a lot of work. People are calling all the time because they want to spend money because they can't keep it. I mean, where do you put it? In a drawer? And then when you have several billions because you have a supermarket in Togo or Angola or, uh, <laughs> or Ivory Coast, what do you do? I mean, at some point, <laughs> you think of simply spending it. It's very weird like that. So this guy, uh, he lives in uh, Nigeria, and he did sports, and basically, super nice guy, uh, he contacted me, so he said, I, I saw one of the houses you built, I would love to, to build one of those houses. I have 6,000 square meters of uh, an orchard in, um, in the south of Lebanon, would you do a house for me? I said, sure. Uh, these are photos of uh, the initial condition of the site. Lebanon is always like this. You have uh, slopes, sometimes gentle, sometimes strong, but never very strong. And there's always a view. I mean, the typical case in Lebanon is that you have a sea view because we are like Chile or like Portugal. We are a vertical um, a, a country, we are a vertical country north south that is looking towards the west where the sun, set, the sun sets. And basically, when I went to Houston and uh, to do my master's degree, it was very funny because I, I couldn't find myself. Because for me, it was clear that wherever the sea is, is the West. But it was actually just a preconceived idea because I was born in an East-West country. But it's not like this for everyone. It's a very rare case, in fact. And so they have this uh, beautiful view. We called it the orchard. Uh, and basically, um, the idea was to create three types of landscapes. The first landscape would be a natural orchard, which is a grid of fruiting trees, whereby they would uh, walk and drive through the fruit and the, the smell of the soil as they are entering into their site. Uh, there would be a more decorative garden with a pool after the house, and there would be a very big house in between. 
uh, these people are also nostalgic for their country. They have lived in Africa for years. Uh, the man married uh, an American woman. And in fact, uh, his children has ne have never lived in the soil of Lebanon. So I told him this is an opportunity for you when, whenever you come back to Lebanon for uh, your summer vacation or other times to uh, experience the earth, experience the soil of your country. So basically, this is why there's this whole transition. I mean, and any normal uh, developer's approach would be to put the house here so that you would have the best view. Actually, I put the house in the middle of the site. You will practically not see it from the street. It will be covered with trees in the foreground. And uh, he was OK with that. So we did the model again. Uh, this time, we used uh, travertino, and we used the holes of the travertino to start to plant uh, the trees uh, inside the stone. Uh, we cast the swimming pool uh, in resin. And then we, we created this spine in the middle of the site which is basically a space for being. It's not really a program. And then the programs will start to plug into uh, the main spine with roofs sloping down in both directions, like in a house. And there will be some of them also which will fragment away uh, from the house or become more transparent as a vegetable garden for uh, next to the kitchen and other programs. So basically there will be the triple of that. So basically there will be another one here and another one there in terms of size. This would be the ornamental garden, this would be the house, and on top would be the orchard. So we decided to use uh, a very local stone, which is called spuma, uh, to create uh, paneling, uh, which is going to be chiseled, uh, engraved, and uh, actually striated and then hand chiseled. Uh, to create a very organic texture on the places where we will have opacity, and then uh, simple transparency on a regular 1.2 meter steel structure for the main facade, and the white concrete for the closed walls. Uh, all the roofs will be in um, terracotta, but in white as well. Uh, this also uh, re responds to uh, regulations. You have regulation to clad with stone and covered with terracotta. So we're twisting it a bit by making the terracotta white and by making the stone like a paneling system, but it's still uh, somehow responding to uh, the building law. So we are also on site. Uh, so this is the beginning. <laughs> so you can see the, uh, the slopes uh, of, uh, of the roofs that are coming out. Uh, I like to make the structure as thin as possible, uh, not because only it's efficient, but because it's magical to, to see today architecture being held with such small things. It's, and of course, having good uh, structural engineers. So this is one of the volumes that continues like this. And the view um, in the background, this is a couple of months ago, we were checking the concrete samples and other materials, uh, you know, giving the green light for uh, further construction. One more. So uh, this is actually a project from um, 2008. Um, it's completed as well. And uh, basically, uh, uh, a man came to me. He had the typical ideal site of uh, the Lebanese coast, basically the slope going down towards the sea. The sea is here. So basically, he wanted to have this dream weekend house where basically he could uh, enjoy uh, the sea view. So very quickly, I mean, the, the intuition was to simply, you know, make a pier, make a make a wooden pier, and, uh, and look to look towards the sea. That's it. You know, there, there's nothing to do in a site that is so uh, so wonderful. So uh, I mean, this was. This is a, a kind of optimistic unfolding of the Cineplex because uh, it, it happened practically at the same moment as the Cineplex, uh, but uh, this is something that uh, fortunately uh, succeeded and, uh, and was built. So this was a photo of the model. Uh, I would like to talk a bit more in detail about it because it's very interesting uh, conception. So basically when you arrive at the, uh, at the gate, there's a small concrete wall and then it's barely level of clearance, it's like 2.4 something. 
and then it starts to open up towards a bit more. You can park the car under the pergola. This is the natural slope, and then you can reconnect to a small infinity pool, and then later on, the sea. Uh, the lower level is uh, a reception level with a kitchen and some gym in the background. The mid level is two bedrooms for the kids, and the top level is a 20 meter lab pool with a master bedroom. So uh, the idea is simply to be able to experience all of the house without having to enter the house. So basically there would be circulations up and down, you see them in another section, that will take you to all the levels. Uh, the structure is all made in steel for legal reasons because there was an existing um, structure there and we had to, to say that we are doing a temporary structure in terms of permit. Uh, but also, of course, for me, it was an opportunity to do something extremely slim. So you're talking around 16 centimeters at 2.5 meter grid uh, that we'll be holding uh, you know, tons of, uh, of water and uh, all of the structure. So basically, the main uh, structure is steel. Uh, it's uh, covered with glass and uh, wood as well. So this is the other section where you will see that you can access the roof level and you can access the lower level uh, from the outside. This is where the house starts. This is the basement level where you have the dining room, the living room, the open kitchen, and then a bit of gym. This is the staircase coming from up. You are actually arriving from up to the outside. This is the glass line. And you continue to the outside and you can continue to um, to the, to the sea. Uh, on the mid-level, you can park under the pergola, uh, go down a few steps, enter a family room, two bedrooms with a void, and a balcony, and you can also staircase up to, to the roof. And on the roof level, you can use the external staircase or the internal staircase, small living and the suite of uh, the parents, uh, also with a deck on the view. And this is the pool. They can open the glass and uh, swim uh, doing lap pools with small windows that are uh, open to the space below. So uh, to be able to put the, the pool in a seed structure, we, we created actually a a huge basin, which is like a, a tub, a bathtub in uh, fiberglass, which we inserted uh, into the structure, uh, and uh, it had its own uh, overflow with the little windows. This is the typical construction system. So basically, you end with a, a corrugated metal sheet, and you cast a small slab of concrete, and then you finish it with whatever you want to finish. For example, in this case, it was ceramic or wood. Uh, and the rest of the structure is holding itself. Of course, you can use all the sicknesses to pass by uh, air conditioning, uh, piping, etc. So this is the green thing. People were uh, very much in love with this project. It had a lot of uh, publications. It's the arrival point with the, the windows of the pool. So, um, I would like to talk a bit more about uh, Lao Tzu. Before we close.
Okay, so um, I know it's a bit confusing, <laughs> but uh, I would like to explain, try to explain a bit what he meant. So he's saying, first of all, he talks about uh, a word, uh, he, meant, he uses a word which is called Tao. So Tao refers to something which you cannot name. Uh, in the Western tradition, you know, they have invented the, the word God, which is actually very problematic because it humanizes and names uh, that which is not. So he is saying from the beginning, the one that can be told is not the eternal one. So the moment you are uttering a word, it's not it anymore. And then he reinforces that in the second sentence, the name that can be named is not the eternal name. So the moment you are naming anything, you are giving a name to anything, you are entering into the world of duality, what is and what is not. Because if I call you Andrea, I stop calling you all the infinite possibilities of what you could be. So I have limited you, which is very practical in life, in everyday life, but it is impractical in reality, in the, cons in the experience of reality. It is impractical to name that, and it is very dangerous, in fact. So he's saying the nameless is the beginning of heaven and earth. The named is the mother of 10,000 things. So the named is the beginning of creation. And then he says this very strange thing. Ever desireless, one can see the mystery. So when you are not in desire process, you see the mystery. Ever desiring, one sees the manifestations. So when you are desiring, you are attaching, starting to attach to the physical manifestations. But then he says, these two, the desireless and the desiring, these are the two he's mentioning, the desireless and desiring, which are, which are two opposites, these two, spring from the same source. So both the desireless and the desiring spring from the same source. But they just differ in name. This appears as darkness. What does he mean here by darkness? He means that it's very bizarre. It's very bizarre that both things, both sides of the story spring from the same source. He's also saying, in a way, that both the good and the evil spring from the same source. And Friedrich Nietzsche, who is Western in the end, said, beyond good and evil. And then he says, darkness within darkness, the gate to all mystery. So what does it mean? He means to say that Yes, life is very strange and very mysterious. It is made out of situations which are unconceivable. You know, it is unconceivable that I could be in my office in August 2020, and out of the blue, I can be evaporated. Right now, I could be that, but I had the chance to be just a bit away from the office the, way the, the day the explosion happened. But when I came back to the office, it was wiped out, everything wiped out, and some people didn't have my luck. So it is very weird that life could serve you such undigestible things. And all the more in, in a country so intense as Lebanon. So chaotic, and yet in this chaos, so much potential. And then he says, darkness within darkness, the gate to all mystery. What does he mean? He means by all means, indulge in the darkness. Don't drop it. Don't try to fix the world. Enter into the adventure. And you will find, it's a gate, he's using, using the word gate, that actually if you are willing to face those most horrible things, which in fact I didn't even choose, or maybe I think that I haven't chosen, but they happen to me anyways, and they happen to all my uh, um, colleagues, I mean, collaborators and friends and nationals in, in Lebanon. 
when we face such adversity, either we become traumatized or we become um, frozen, like in, incapable of movement, or we become over activists, which actually doesn't allow you to move as well, or you have to enter into the darkness and see. Basically, all of this work that you are seeing is the result of an attitude which said, you know what, it's okay. The building, the office was demolished, fine. But tomorrow, we are going to take a decision to fix it. Because we want to say to our clients, we are still here. And actually, the clients came because they saw that the office is still open. So I want to show you just a few images of our daily life. So uh, if you want to know more, <laughs> I tell all those stories in, in the book. And also, uh, Pedro had uh, the gracefulness of inviting me to uh, record podcasts. Uh, I have many, many, many more stories. I can talk for hours. <laughs> it's one of my <laughs> characteristics. I love to talk. It's also the sign of the Gemini. It's very uh, talkative. Uh, if you have any questions, it will be my pleasure. by your lecture. It was very, very nice. I learned a lot. I have a lot of appointments. <laughs> yeah, I don't know where to start. But um, I would say that um, I have always this feeling when I listen to you, maybe that's why I like so much to listen to you, <laughs> is that it's like, um, you know, there is this build viola as an um, installation with several tissues and then it projects the image through this tissue. Okay, so you have, it's the same image. There is the light passing through, it's the same installation, the tissues are more or less the same, but it's always different. So it's a kind of, I like very much viola, and that uh, layering of the image, it's a very sensitive thing and very, um, let's say, not so much uh, occidental light. Uh, so that's maybe that's why I, when I see your work and when you present it, it's like, uh, don't take it in a bad way because maybe the word is not correct, but I, I see it as a kind of a blur architect. Blur in, the, in a good sense, okay? So it's, in a, it's, in a, in a, uh, it's a technique of painting, as you know, but it's also a kind of uh, trying to blur things, trying to make it with fumato. With fumato. <laughs> Formato architetto, formato. <laughs> and it's like a bit, uh, maybe for sure you will tell me that that's because that's going to be my question. Um, has to do also a bit with your uh, geography and your references and where you are. But um, it's uh, even when you have these clients that are not the edge, it's the middle of the river. Yes. You always try to uh, make it uh, sfumato. You always try to blur with the context. That's very, very clear. It was more than clear that. And um, 
and it's a kind of answer that uh, I think it's very interesting. For the for the um, the students, I would like to ask you three questions. Okay, the first one it's a kind of a joke, but I'm very curious to know if you would be a painter, what painter would you be? <laughs> Second question would be, would you be a different uh, architect if you were living in Paris? <laughs> and the third question, and this is for the students, that was the same question that Michele made me yesterday and I couldn't really answer, is, is there a lesson? I know that you gave that lesson here of the darkness that I... Embrace the darkness, that's the lesson. Embrace the, that's the lesson. But I would like that you would be more clear because they are students I will, I can on, elaborate. On, on, on that, okay? Because I think it was very clear, but I would I like to elaborate. emphasize that. Thank you, Pedro. Uh, so for the painter, uh, I have a lot of uh, painters I like. Uh, I could have been Francis Bacon, uh, but uh, not uh, to kill myself. <laughs> I mean, I could have been David Lynch. Uh, I, I, I like bad things, <laughs> but it doesn't mean that, that, that an artist who is portraying ugly things, he lives in an ugly way. It's not because in literature there are horror situations that the person is in love with horror. On the contrary, I think the purpose of art is to portray the darkness so that in our daily life, we can be civilized people. Uh, so for me, it is very cathartic to watch <laughs> David Lynch so that I can go, come back to normal life uh, even stronger, not because I want to uh, commit the same atrocities in, uh, in real life. I think the, pos the possibility and the po power of fiction and of art is to do it in the world of fiction, not to do it in, in daily life. And uh, most of the authors I like are, are quite dark, uh, but it doesn't mean, you know, I mean, you, you see me on every day, you know, I'm, <laughs> I'm a happy person. Um, the second question was if I was in Paris. So that's a very interesting question, um, because yes, uh, I am the result of a situation which is not Occidental purely, but it is not Oriental purely as well. I am exactly at a meeting point, and you can also see it in my architecture. My architecture has a lot of Occidental references, by all means, a lot. It has a lot of uh, systematization. I love rhythm. I love grids. I love uh, I love regular uh, axes. I love uh, right angles. You know, all of this is much more in the Occident than in the in the Orient. Uh, I am the result of this education. I was uh, educated in the French Lycée in the American University of Beirut in Rice University. Uh, I speak much better about architecture in French or in English than in Arabic. That being said, I have noticed and experienced very clearly how much I am not American when I went to the States and lived there. And I realized that I live in another level of layered complexity. Uh, that, that you mentioned, and that, no, I do not think in terms of black and white, that's for sure. Uh, and it is in the layers of the grayness that I enjoy most, and uh, those layers of the grayness, I have ex uh, expressed them uh, in many projects in many ways, and I mean, the, the two cinema projects are very clear, you know, about how to completely render an image, something that you cannot trust. An image is something that you cannot trust. An image is something that is fleeting, that is changing, that has uh, much more possibility, uh, much more possibilities of meaning than uh, what we think. Uh, the third, uh, ah, so Paris. Uh, so if I was uh, in Paris, the question would be, would be either whether I was born there or if I moved there. So if I was born there, I think I would be a different architect for sure. Uh, but I think that one architect, that, a French architect that I like was Jean Nouvel, he's aware of the limitations of the Occidental mind. And in many of his projects, like when, for example, Fondation Cartier, uh, there is a whole process of dematerialization which is at work. And so he knows very well that it doesn't end at a, at a clear uh, black and white statement. Uh, if I was to move to Paris, then of course 
I would be the result, uh, or, or I would become more international because I'm getting actually more projects outside of Lebanon. I mean, the, 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 gene the genealogy, the genetics that I have, I cannot now remove them, and I don't even want to because I love them. So, uh, so I will use uh, this, uh, this baggage to apply it uh, in all contexts. And uh, actually, this is what will make my, my original proposition. Otherwise, you can go for another argument if you're interested in my vision. Most welcome. You know, I always say that you know, when a client rejects me, it means to me that, a client, that the client wasn't compatible with what I was uh, trying to say. You know, I'm not pretentious. I'm just saying you know, that it's all chemistry in the end. You know, with some people, it will work. With some others, it won't work. Uh, so for the person who understands a bit the world that I'm trying to talk about, um, they're most welcome. And it will be an opportunity. I mean, in the end, it's an artwork. Let's face it. Architecture is an artwork beyond everything. Beyond technique, beyond parameter, parameticism, beyond systematization, beyond contextualism, beyond everything that we can talk about architecture, sustainability. Uh, architecture is an art. It's an opportunity to express in space a poem. In space. It's a poem in space. So you like this, this type of poetry? Most welcome. What is the third question? For the students. Okay. So, okay, yeah. I mean, basically, I tried to say it also in the projects. You know, I showed in the projects many projects which were uh, failures. You know, I, I said that the Cineplex was a heartbreak. I said that um, the 1984 project was uh, exploded by the, by, the, by the explosion, was wiped out by the explosion. And I can tell you also much more horrible stories. You know, I can tell you stories about clients stopping to pay, Valerio. Uh, I, can tell you, <laughs> I can tell you about clients uh, betraying you. I can tell you about uh, illegal things being attempted. I can tell you about a client deciding to go on site, talk to the contractor, and do something against the drawings on his own. This is the, the, the consequences of living in chaos. You, have, you want to live in chaos, you have to accept that anything could happen. That being said, uh, despite uh, all this uh, quite dark uh, diagnosis, uh, the, uh, the practice is going very well. In the middle of not being able to get checks or, or getting bank transfers, we have a lot of work. So what do you make out of this contradiction other than darkness within darkness, the gate to all mystery? Accept the contradiction if you really who want to pursue whatever you want to pursue, you must pursue it. I mean, it's a short life. You have a certain talent as an architect, as a poet, as a painter, as whatever. If, if you're not going to do it in this short life, when are you going to do it? You must do it. I struggled for 20 years, at least, of disappointment upon disappointment. And how many times would you ask yourself the question, I don't want to be an architect anymore. And how many, how many disappointments do you have to face until you say, you know, I don't want this anymore. And then when you say yes, the explosion wipes out your, your office. You sit on your couch after the explosion the second day. You ask yourself, so do I repair or do I close? Do I move to Paris? <laughs> I thought about it. I thought about this exact so, <laughs> but I mean, why, why Paris? What's so great about Paris? They're crazy. And so, <laughs> no, seriously, I'd rather move to Milan, frankly. So, uh, so no, I decided, no, definitely I will, I will fix the, the office. I love architecture. I'm, maybe I'm a bit crazy in love. Therefore, uh, you know, it's, uh, therefore it's, uh, un, uh, you know, unexplainable. Why you why love is not logical? <laughs> Simply, love is not logical. That's the the clearest, simplest statement I could do about uh, about this. You pursue because you love, and then uh, there will be challenges. But because you love, you continue doing it. That's it.
<laughs> Maybe it's, 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 the Gemini, it's the Gemini connection, probably. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, no um, thanks for the presentation. And um, something that I was thinking about also after your last word about the, the poet and the poem and the, the fact that the architecture has this important artistic uh, level. But um, it's something that for me comes also out from your, um, uh, from your uh, maquette. And so I want to ask you if, you if you want to explain a little bit your approach with the maquette and how uh, they are, uh, it seems to be for in your work, uh, from your presentation, an instrument of project, not only to verify some questions about states and proportion that are for sure verified by the model, but also an instrument to communicate uh, uh, another level of the project, uh, which is about the, the storytelling, which is about the, the, the inspiration behind uh, and the idea that you want to forecast for your uh, design, for example. Yeah. Thank you, Julia. Um, so another level, I think, is uh, very beautifully put, another level. I'm very interested in what you're saying, another level. You know, that's what I would like to do all the time. You know, that there would be always another level, because I think this is what you're saying when you say another level is the difference between a building and architecture. A building is a is a structure. You know, any any structure is a is a building. Any building is a structure, but for a building to be a piece of architecture, it needs another level. To have a, to reach to another level, you need to have an idea. In order to have an idea, it's not just, you know, you cannot Google an idea. It's not possible. <laughs> no, it cannot be done. <laughs> you cannot Pinterest a project. My clients come, I have two iPads of Pinterest. <laughs> but you know, my, my kids, they broke the iPad. I told them that's so good. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so happy they broke the iPad. <laughs> so that I cannot see your Pinterest board. Because I'm not interested. <laughs> I mean, of course, I'm interested in the client, of course. I'm very heavily interested in the client. I'm in love with the site. I'm in love with the client, but um, there's a limit. Uh, having an idea means that you have been able to consolidate your past experiences of architecture, your skills, as well as your perception of a place, your clear perception of a place into a conceptual language that would be relevant to the place. This is why my architecture is always different. You know, I never do the same things because I don't believe, you know, in Richard Mayer. Uh, you know, it's always white, always grid, always this. I mean, how come? I mean, it's always different. This, how come the situation is always different, but we end up always with the same architecture? There's something fishy about that. <laughs> so for me, an idea is the result of the perception of a situation. And uh, to express that in a model uh, is, of course, an opportunity. I am not interested in the model to be fully realistic. My trees are never green on the models. <laughs> uh, the landscapes are never green on the model, I mean, except some rare cases. But the project is completely legible. So this is the in-between. You know, you create a certain language for the model. You select certain materials that are going to bring about the idea as much as possible. But you are going to still be able to see the project. Because in the end, you are talking to a non-architect. Anyways, even if they were an architect, or they were architects, it needs to be legible. So legibility, I think, by all means, conceptual legibility, model legibility, drawings legibility, is always talking legibility. When you are talking to a client, it needs to be clear. It needs to be understood what you are saying. I have a problem with architects who use language which is Non, not understandable. I mean, how come? I mean, there are simpler words used now. And if there's no simpler words than a, much, a bit more complicated word, okay, you use a complicated word because you don't have the choice. But don't show off vocabulary. <laughs> don't show off anything. Just be yourself, 
have an idea, have the, the honest idea that you really feel this is the relevant thing to do. As you are progressing in your career, the ideas evolve, of course, because you are learning more things as you are building. And you are learning more things as what worked with certain clients, what didn't work. And then express it. I'm not against renderings. I do renderings all the time. I even do walk, walk through videos because it works. Uh, but I try to avoid rendering. This is why in this presentation there is no rendering whatsoever. This is why on my Instagram there is no rendering whatsoever. I like photography. I think that it's great to work with a photographer to, to really bring someone that has an external point of view and tell them, please photograph. Photograph this model. Even photographing the models, I bring a photographer who has a perception and who has a concept. You know, he, he or she proposes, I'm going to photograph like this. What do you think? I mean, for me, this is also design. It's to take an angle. So yes, by all means, uh, the choice of materials, the choice of how we construct the model, how abstract or not it is, is intentional uh, to be able to portray a certain uh, concept. By all means, the most important aspect of my work is the idea. You should have an idea. I, I just wanted, I, I felt like sharing a thought that uh, was somehow already in my mind, but uh, after what Julia said, uh, I felt the need of uh, having your, your take on this because um, yeah. I feel like there is a, a word that is um, summarizing, even if summarizing is not always a good thing, but for me it is, <laughs> since I have a problem uh, <laughs> with words. And this word is care. Uh, because I felt like whatever you showed us today is an expression of care. And uh, the care is the care for, um, of course, it's the care for the client, the care for the context, and we talked about that yesterday. And also um, the care for um, a country's situation, and the care for, um, I don't know, the care for. Um, the way you express uh, your ideas through the model, uh, the way that you, I don't know, that you show care for, um, for the history of, uh, of places uh, and all of those things. So I think that care could be a very important word to, and it's a very simple word, I think. But it be a very, I mean, it's a simple concept. I mean, it's one of the basics. It's not complicated thing. Uh, but still, as um, I, mean, I, I think that it's something that we, that when we have to do with architecture, it's something that we never have to uh, take for granted. Because uh, when we have to do with design, we really need to care about what we do and to care about where we do it. And I don't know, also the, the occasion of a workshop, which is a very quick. Uh, thing. Uh, it can be, it is quick, but it, it still can be an opportunity, an opportunity to say something and to care, to show, to show stuff. But I want to say what you So, I want to tell you a small story about uh, 2003. I was sitting on my friend's couch in New York and uh, I was asking myself whether I become American. Uh, why I wanted to become American because, uh, you know, Lebanon is full of problems. I was only 27 years old at the time. Becoming American is a certain uh, safety uh, net to become American. You uh, get uh, some uh, laws. There are laws. So I looked for a job in New York and I couldn't find anything. It was after 2001, you know. September 11th, and all sorts of uh, catastrophes, recession, I don't know what. I had $40 in my bank account. And I asked myself the crossroads situation. You know, do I come back to Lebanon or I stay in the United States? And I, want, I am saying this not because I am so in love with Lebanon. Because it's a love and hate situation when someone, when, it, when a country hates you so much, and yet it's still so lovable. I, I, ex I experienced the extreme of contradiction. Uh, yet, I decide uh, to come back to Lebanon. So I told my mother, 
And I tell her, could you please send me a one-way ticket <laughs> to Beirut? <laughs> because I don't have the money for it. So she sent me a one-way ticket to Beirut, and I returned. From 2003 until 2020, the explosion, if I can count how many times I wanted to care less about the country and to leave, and to tell you how many of my friends, architects in particular, have left the country to go to Paris or anywhere. And again, I'm telling you, I didn't not leave Lebanon, not because I love it, because I simply couldn't. And simply couldn't is not emotional. They would, every once in a while, something would happen that would give me one more reason to stay. It's karma. Kind of you know, something happens, you know, and, but I wanted to leave, and then, you know, I win the competition. Okay, next time. <laughs> and, then, uh, and then the competition doesn't get built, you know, and we get in a big fight with the client. Okay, we're ready to leave. And then someone calls, you know, we're going to do this. Like that, for 19 years, for actually 17 years, until 2020. 2020 was a turning point. Because 2020 was beginning a lot of lots of projects, financial crisis and explosion, like, Again, black and white, you know, the extremes. And after the explosion, you know, when I was sitting on my couch and asking myself whether I fixed the office, I said, you, you know, I could always open a branch in Paris. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, you, you're saying that I'm a caring person. It's nice. Thank you. Uh, but uh, somehow I think that life is forcing me. It's not me who you want to be a loving person. I'm not. No, you know, I want to be not loving, I want to be a bad boy. Yeah, I but, okay, I want, I want to be careless. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not happening. <laughs> it's not letting me. <laughs> Any more questions? You can. I just, uh, a little. What I, I'm very impressed by also in your book, also in the, in the, the piece you showed that about uh, all the intersection you showed, about uh, uh, the, the way you are the way you are representing uh, sections. I mean, the ground, the earth, the soil within your um, well uh, within your drawings, becoming a new horizon. For example, on this uh, last uh, house, with, so the horizontal lens. And uh, to me, also in, uh, in some of your uh, drawings, it sounds like uh, a very clear element. So the ground, inclination, and the architecture that is horizontal. But uh, and then when, for example, I saw the last uh, peak of, you know, last image of your uh, building, then it is not so clear. I mean, the, the other parts are chaotic because, as you say, you are maybe used to count situation. So vegetation, other elements. Yeah. It's yeah. Outside, by the way, the vegetation outside of the set. Yeah. On the set. But yes, yeah. I, I am for uh, I am for that. Yes. Yeah. No, I, I my, my, my question is about that. Is the ground you are representing so strongly? Uh, okay, yes. Okay. Here you maybe you are losing this identity. Immaterial. Yeah. And the ground you are representing in your drawings uh, so strongly. Is, uh, it is part of the identity of the, pro the project, or maybe it is something uh, um, fighting with the chaos uh, of, of, the, of the soil? Interesting question. Uh, thank you, Michele. My, my nephew, his name is John. He says, uh, Khalo. Khalo, it means uncle from the side of the mother in Arabic. Uh, Khalo, your architecture is like whoosh. <laughs> 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 so it has the whoosh. Of, uh, of this. <laughs> so yes, I love horizontals. Uh, and uh, yes, I like a lot that you can recognize that it is man-made. Yes. That is man-made. It's made, made man -made. by a man, by a human, I mean, not a man. Uh, okay. Handmade, handmade, man-made. Uh, yeah, I, mean, I, for example, architecture that becomes very blobby, orga organic, is not really my piece of cake because it's not simple, first of all. It's, and I love, I mean, for me, simplicity is very important because I, I like to be able to, 
bid it simply. I, I, I still, I mean, everything that I attempt in Lebanon, even certain contractors, is extremely ambitious. But now, by the time, you know, 20 years down the line, I have very good contractors, so I can do whatever I want. So if, even if I wanted to do Frank Gehry, I could. But, uh, I mean, of course, given the budget. Um, but to answer your question, there is a philosophical uh, intent in the line. It, it is intentional. It is intentional that the line is man-made, and it is legible that the line is man-made. It is intentional. I want that. I want, I want people to recognize nature. And to be able to recognize nature, I don't want architecture to pretend to be nature. It has naturalness to it. It has wood, it has transparency, it has reflectivity, it has softness, OK. But it is man-made, it is clear. It's like Tlaouando talking about nature in the Azuma house, and he, he does a co fully concrete house. And then he tells you, yes, but in the courtyard, because it's so pure, you will be able to see all the different colors of the reflection of the, of the sky. I think he has a point there. It's that the architecture is not pretending to be like nature. It is what it is, and it allows for the possibility of the changes of nature, the clouds, the shadows to appear. I was very happy that the, the plants were growing in the neighboring sites because it allowed for this line to get blurred. That's the, that the final vision is this one, but it's just that most of, not all of the vision is in my hands. So I do my part and uh, thankfully it worked. Um, of course, uh, it's important that you have a client who understands what you're talking about, uh, so, so that they will, they will proceed with living and understanding and enjoying. I mean, if, anyways, if they don't understand, it's not for them. So I'm not the right architect for, for them if they don't understand what I'm talking about. And I'm not saying anything very, very special. It's just that I think the main source of suffering that architects go through is Prejudice. Basically, people come to you with preconceived ideas of what the project should be. And prejudice is a problem because uh, I don't know what the project should be. I want to explore with you on this site, with your program, with your means, with your budget, with your materials, what it should be. Let's search together, that's what I'm saying. So if you're coming and telling me this is the solution, we have a problem. But yeah, I mean, whoosh, whoosh. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you for your presentation, and I'm very curious. Uh, what inspires you and sparks you to uh, study Lao and uh, Dao De Jing? Because even for us, our Chinese students, it's very hard to understand the essay uh, written um, thousand years ago. I and. Uh, uh, how you use that idea in your work, and how you study it. Okay, so about Lao Tzu. Um, Lao Tzu, Lao Tzu. I, I met Lao Tzu in 2001. I mean, he was not in person. <laughs> um, and uh, for me, it was a revelation because I found some, someone who finally was able to talk spirituality without uh, imposing on me a dogma, a dogma. I have to believe something, you know? He's saying you cannot believe anything, and he's saying basically you cannot understand anything. And he's saying also that the, any word that you're going to put is not gonna amount to the wonderfulness and the meraviglioso of life. You know, the reality that we live in is wonderful. And putting a word to it is always to, going to be a limitation. When I came across Lao Tzu, I was like, you know, now I can call myself spiritual again, because I found someone who can talk spirituality without imposing on me something that I have to believe. I have problem with beliefs, because beliefs really are uh, prejudice. Belief is prejudice. You, we need to be able to proceed with life with an open mind and to walk, you know, moment after moment, present moment after present moment after present moment, and to be open 
to all the possibilities of all this moment are offering. And I felt that Lao Tzu was giving me this. He was also telling me that, you know what, you have to be very courageous because darkness was in darkness. And since I was not living in Switzerland, nor in Norway, <laughs> nor in you know, one of those perfect countries where everyone is committing suicide, <laughs> it's true. Uh, I was living in a country where there is no protection. There is no protection of any system. Like even government, there isn't. Bank, there isn't. There is nothing. Nothing works. And yet, you know, I'm working. We say in Arabic, alhamdulillah, you know, thanks God. It's uh, alhamdulillah, you're Egyptian, yeah. So, uh, you know, no problem. It's, uh, we, we're, we're, still, we're still continuing, we're still alive. You know, I showed you pictures of the office. We fixed it, we're alive, we had the presentation, we're doing a new house for a client. They're happy, they're smiling. We changed the curtain, the curtain was gray. With the new office, we put it flowery. So, Lao Tzu, it means be courageous, it means uh, continue, don't give up. Uh, it means that um, it's going to be difficult. He's saying that as well. He's saying that it, life has pain, life has frustrations, it's inevitable. Now what you do with it, it's your choice. That's freedom. Freedom is to accept, you know, that uh, you might die the next moment, but in the meantime, uh, we're going to have a good time together. Thank you very much.